You know, there's a, there's a Christian motivational speaker and comedian, Ken Davis, who kind of, he kind of illustrates this in one of his shows. He talked to the crowd as he was getting started. And he said, you know what? He goes, you want to know why all of you are here at the 9 o'clock show? See, it's because you wanted to come to the 7 o'clock show, but when you went to get the tickets, you thought to yourself, eh, I'll do it later, and you procrastinated on it. And that's why you're at the 9 o'clock show. And he goes, you're my kind of people. And it's just this idea that we put off the simplistic things in life. And a lot of times that has to do with perspective, too. Our perspective can get in the way and cause us to say maybe later. And one of my greatest illustrations, one of my favorite stories about perspective and keeping your focus in the right place comes from when I was an eighth grade student. And I was on a school trip to a camp called the Wilds in South Carolina. And we had a speaker for that few days while we were at that camp who was clearly fresh off the wagon of college and Bible preaching. And he was your classic hellfire and brimstone Baptist preacher. Okay, this guy was all about the in your face, you're going to hear me. And it's not that that was necessarily bad. The problem is, is what he was trying to get us to hear, he allowed himself to become distracted. His perspective was not in the right place. And so we walked away from that, not remembering what he wanted us to remember, but remembering what was pointless and we didn't need to remember. He was trying to talk about communication. He was trying to talk about how we communicate with Jesus to deepen our relationship. That's about all I remember was the thematic topic of the three days. This guy had the um, <clears throat> tick of using the word folks or young people in just about every other statement. In fact, on many occasions, he would go, now folks, listen up, young people. And you're going, you lost me already, man, because you're just using the same words over and over again. I was sitting next to a friend of mine and our English teacher at that point in time, and I, I glanced down, and the two of them had a piece of paper between them. They were actually keeping tally marks on how many times he said folks and how many times he said young people. This was the level of entertainment, because he would lose perspective. He would come at us for reasons that were completely unrelated to the concept of what he was trying to get across. And the thing I remember most was this moment. I'm going to do my best impression of this guy, all right? He goes, I don't think everybody's listening to me. Folks, young people, you need to start listening up. See, because I'm hearing some snickering, and I'm not going to point any fingers, but there's some snickering. It's coming from right over here. Now, if you're snickering, that means that you aren't paying attention. It means that you're laughing at other things. You aren't paying attention to what I have to say. And if you aren't paying attention to me, you aren't paying attention to what I'm saying. And that means that you have a problem with me. And if you have a problem with me, then you have a problem with God. No, no, no. You're, you're allowing the distractions of what's happening and your perspective of it to put off the important message you're trying to get across to us. And he spent a lot of time focused on holding everybody down in those ways. And much of what he said was in that vein. That's why I said what I remember from that really serves no real purpose other than to be a decent illustration for this point. Sometimes we try too hard. Sometimes we let that get out of focus and we shoot for the wrong standard. Now, last week we started this series, and I'm wondering, how many of you took the time and, and investigated, do you know what your but first is? Do you know what it is that is causing you to procrastinate? Are those excuses leading you to the addiction of tomorrow? Are they leading you to the, eh, maybe later? Here's the catch with the idea of but first. The idea of but first doesn't just have to be our excuses. The, that idea can also be the but first, the will of God. So how do we change the but first excuses into but first, the will of God? Well, look with me at Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, 
that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. You know, currently, we live in a society that kind of gives us two choices. It gives us two choices. Society itself. The first choice is this. We can choose to stand upon the truth of God. We can be a societal outcast right now and stand on that truth. And that's going to be where our focus is going to be. It's either that or we can conform to the new way of thinking. By today's terminology, you can either stand on the truths of God or you can be woke. Paul tells us in Romans that we're not supposed to conform to that way of thinking. Instead, we need to be choosing the truth of God's word. And if we do that, then we can be transformed in our minds and we'll be able to test and discern what that will that God has for us is. So how do we go about accomplishing that needed renewal? This morning, I want to take us through a four-step process, what I call the four A's of renewal. And the first one, this is, our big, this is our big dictionary word for this morning, astuteness. This is the first A of renewal, astuteness. Now, this is basically just a fancy word for wisdom. Or if you want to take it a step further, more directly stated, astuteness is a big word for educated, knowledgeable. Now, I think that we need to be educated by the wisdom of God. His word is where we should go to truly be educated. If we're not going to conform to a woke lifestyle, then we are going to conform to standing on God's word. And in that case, that's good conformity. And so we do that by getting into it and educating ourselves by the wisdom that is in it. Proverbs 1, 7. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. Fools despise wisdom and instruction. See, fools choose to live in the addiction of tomorrow, but a renewal by astuteness, a renewal by education begins when we what? According to Proverbs, fear the Lord. That's what we do. We begin our journey of wisdom by fearing God. Now, we're not talking about fear in the sense of being scared of him. We're talking about fear in the sense of respecting what he's called us to do in seeking his will. Our trust in this promise then carries us forward within the will of God for our lives. So we put our faith in God through that. We gain the wisdom, and the will of God begins to play itself out. Proverbs 3, 5 through 8. Trust in the Lord with all your heart. Do not lean on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him, and he will make straight your paths. Now 5 and 6 we know. Those are verses that we're taught as children. We understand that concept, but we kind of forget to move on and look at the surrounding scripture around this because Solomon is making a much greater point when he coincides this to verse 7 and 8. Be not wise in your own eyes, fear the Lord, and turn away from evil. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. So we have to first trust, trust in God, then we choose to acknowledge it, this is gaining education, understanding wisdom. We acknowledge it. Third, then we listen so that we can better understand what God is speaking. And that will lead us to a promise that we overlook so quickly here. It will be healing to your flesh and refreshment to your bones. Conforming to the world will only cause more conflict. It will only cause more uprising. It will only cause you more distress. But a conformity or an astuteness, an educated study in growing in the wisdom of God, it is a healing and a refreshment. And it's not by our own power that we do this. Obviously, we can't do this alone. We don't do it by ourselves. It's not by anything that we're capable of of doing other than making the choice to dive into the word and to grow and that leads us to the second a it's not by our own power that we move within the will of god it is by awareness awareness last week we talked about a catch 22 in this situation that when our focus is on our own power when we are putting a reliability on ourselves and what we can do and then we end up worrying about everything that we're supposed to take care of and we put that focus in that area 
then the catch right is this, is we end up forgetting completely that God is the ultimate one that's providing everything that we're worrying about. It's very ironic. He tells us, I'm going to take care of this. He is the proverbial God as well. I'm going to provide for you. I'm going to take care of you. Look at the birds. Look at the flowers. Trust me, I got this. If I could take care of them like that, you're more important. I'll take care of you. But what do we do? We worry about all of that stuff, forgetting that he's the one that provides all of it to begin with. We have to be aware of our thoughts, and we have to be aware of the things that we're trying to control. 2 Corinthians 4, 7 says, But we have this treasure in jars of clay to show that this surpassing power belongs to God and not to us. Later in that same chapter, verse 18, as we look not to the things that are seen, but to the things that are unseen. For the things that are seen are transient, but the things that are unseen are eternal. Again, aware that the power is not of our own accomplishment. It is not something that we do upon our own ability, but it is something that comes from the all-surpassing power, knowledge, wisdom, and understanding of God the Father Almighty. Renewal by awareness does not focus on the worry of the things that are around us. It doesn't put an emphasis on the things that we think we have to control. Instead, that focus should come from an awareness that is built on the astuteness, the education that we get from our study in the Word of God and listening to Him through prayer and communication. Paul reminds us deeper of this in Scripture in his letter to the church at Colossians, chapter 3, verse 2. Set your minds on things that are above, not on things that are on earth. So just as he said in Romans, he returns it to the Colossians. We are transformed by the renewing of our minds. Therefore, our mind this must be set on things above. We are not going to be able to renew our minds. We are not going to be able to come into a new state of thinking within wisdom and the will of God if we are spending our time dwelling on everything that's around us here. As it said, for the things that are seen are transient. The things that we see, these are physical, these are material. These are the things that honestly we think we can control, but maybe we can't always control them. And when we focus on that, our worry overwhelms us. Instead, we look to the things that are unseen, the things that are eternal. Just like I said last week, if you're making resolutions, if you're deciding to put your butt first aside, stop procrastinating, don't do it just because it's something to do. Do it because it's something that's going to have an eternal impact. As said, we cannot and we should not do it alone. And more directly, through our gained wisdom and knowledge and through an awareness of it, then... In order to accomplish it, there has to be something between our community of believers and between us and God, and that is a three, accountability. Accountability. We have to be held accountable to the choices that we make, both right and wrong. James 5, 16. Therefore, confess your sins to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. The prayer of a righteous person has great power as it is working. Being held accountable means sharing with each other, transparency, honesty, vulnerability, and understanding that we're all broken, we're all messed up, we're all going to fall, but when we have each other to pick each other up in the love of God, we are strengthened and we are better together than we ever are apart. Confession breeds freedom from what holds us back. And prayer, prayer holds us accountable to each other before God. When we pray and we ask for prayer and we give prayer, we're communicating with God and we are accountable to each other for those things. Renewal by accountability develops the astuteness and awareness and it encourages our minds and hearts to focus then on the right path. That path that Solomon told us in Proverbs that if we are in tune to the will of God, he will make our paths straight. But that right path also all has to have a mindset. Paul gives us an insight into that mindset in Philippians 4.8. 
Finally, brothers, whatever is true, whatever is honorable, whatever is just, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is commendable, if there's anything excellent, if there's anything worthy of praise, think about these things. We need to be accountable to each other for the decisions we're making here. That's why we're brothers and sisters in Christ. That's, that's part of the purpose of the relationship that we have. But we're also accountable to God and that right path he wants to set us on and, and the mind of what we're thinking of. Because we're trying to renew our minds. We're trying to move away from this composed way of thinking that the world tells us we should have. If we're truly seeking renewal through accountability, then we will, number one, desire the things that God desires. This goes back to David in Psalm 37. Delight yourself in the Lord. He'll give you the desires of your heart. We have to be careful. That doesn't mean, oh, if I have joy in God, he's going to give me everything that I want. That's not what it means. David's saying, if you delight yourself in God, you'll get the desires of your heart. But what's going to happen is delighting God transforms our mind so that our desires become his desires and his desires become our desires and our will becomes his will. We end up lining up with what he desires. That heart and mind connection becomes something that utterly blows the roof off of wherever you're at and pushes you forward on that path. Again, our minds find the transformation Paul speaks of in Romans because we dwell on things that are above that Paul speaks about in Colossians and focus on things which are listed by Paul in Philippians. I'm going to say that again. Our minds find the transformation Paul speaks of in Romans because we dwell on the things that are above, that Paul speaks about in Colossians, and focus on those things which are listed by Paul in Philippians. So when Paul speaks in Romans about transforming our minds, and he moves that into Colossians and says, you've got to focus on the things that are above. Your mind, as it's being transformed, as it's being renewed, needs to be up there. And then you end up on that right path, and your mind dwells on these amazing things God's doing, and you're focused on what's honorable, what's just, what's true, what's excellence, what's worthy of praise, what has eternal impact. By doing this, our lives begin to take on a shape, not just spiritual, but a physical form, too, that is seen by others around us. And that leads us into the fourth A of renewal, a word that we have been saying a lot over the past several months, action. Our astuteness and our awareness and our accountability, it leads us to action. Our actions are a result of the other A's. Our actions show the renewal that has occurred in our lives. But again, the two sides to this, there's the excuse of but first. And then there's the but first, the will of God. James 4, 17, so whoever knows the right thing to do and fails to do it, for him it is sin. See, this is a reminder of the excuse of but first, the sin of neglect. It's the addiction of tomorrow that we fight, and bluntly, James says it, if we know it and we don't do it, it's sin. That sin of neglect, man. I'll tell you what, when it hits us and we realize that we knew what we were supposed to do and we didn't do it, for me it just, it hurts that much more. Because now, now I willingly chose not to do something God wanted me to do. That guilt trip is hard. Our actions have to show the renewal. So James chapter 2 verse 17, so also faith by itself, if it does not have works, is dead. This is a renewal transition from excuse into the but first the will of God. We begin, to come, we begin to become aware of the choices that we're making. We're held accountable to those choices by God and each other. Our faith becomes more centered on God's plan, and it moves us to action to show it. Our faith becomes action-oriented. It's not just words spoken, but it becomes an action that we do. We're not just hearing what we're supposed to do. Now we are going out and we are doing doing it. We begin to mold to that accountability and our awareness and our growth in the wisdom. James 1.22, be doers of the word, not hearers only, deceiving yourselves. We become doers. We become followers, not just fans. 
When our minds are renewed to the likeness of Christ, we see, we hear, we act, not from our own power, our own point of view, or what our will is, but from his point of view, his will, and his desires for us. We acknowledge that power within us, that that surpassing power, it's not something that is of our ability, it is the spirit that is in us that we have accepted from Almighty God. And a truly renewed mind of Christ will desire to become a doer. How many of you remember the WWJD phase? What would Jesus do? Oh, I had the bracelets, I had the t-shirts, I had the hats. Anybody else? How many people in here walked around with the WWJD bracelet on their wrist? Or some form of merchandising with that? That's great, but I'd like to create a different perspective within, within that. I think sometimes we took that so lightly, so simply in the idea, oh, well, what would Jesus do? Yeah, but maybe, maybe the focus isn't not what he would do, but maybe instead it's what choice would he have us make because of him? What choice would he have us make because of him? That's the idea of that renewed mind. That's the idea of being within the will of God. It's not just what he would do. It's what we're supposed to do because he's exemplified that, and that's what he commands us to follow. Now, all that information we've been through, it leads us back to the answer of the original question. How do we change our but first excuses to the but first the will of God? Well, let me remind you of Romans 12, 2. Do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. So how do we change it? We've been saying it the whole time. The answer is renewing of your mind. The renewing of your mind. Or we could potentially say it this way with the four A's. Astuteness, that is wisdom or education of the Bible, it leads to an awareness of things above that hold us accountable for our actions based on the choices that we have and will make in our lives. Astuteness leads to an awareness of things above that hold us accountable for our actions based on the choices that we have and will make in our lives. Now, don't get me wrong. This isn't easy. Anybody that tells you, oh, you're a Christian, welcome to the easy life. Smack him across the face. You ready to turn the other cheek? This is, this is not easy. It's not simple. And for a lot of people, knowing what comes along with this actually is what makes it difficult for them to accept it. But we have an opportunity in this new year to grow together as well as individually. To become more aware of the things that God is desiring for us as a collective as well as individuals. And we have an opportunity to hold each other accountable to a greater standard. to be a worker unashamed for the cause of Christ in the decisions that we're going to make. And in doing so, the actions that we can move forward in, man, this isn't about being, this isn't about maybe later. The time is now. The time is absolutely now. We don't know if we get tomorrow. We don't know what this world is going to start trying to come after us with. It's time for a sense of urgency within our hearts to grow and to be pushed to action by the will of God. And I'll tell you what, like I said, it's not easy. But in me, I kind of get some chills. I think it's exciting. I hate the fact that it's taken me 38 years to get to this point. But God's doing something. God is doing something.
You ready to join him? You ready to do something you've never done before? Are you ready to see the power of God work in ways that you never thought imaginable? If so, that's exciting. Let's pray. Father, I thank you so much for for everything that you do. Father, I I thank you that every individual that's here this morning or that is online with us, I thank you that we woke up this morning. We took in a breath, we rolled out of bed, and it was a new day. We're alive. We're here. And because of that, Father, it's another opportunity for us to take another day to listen for your voice to grow in your wisdom, to be aware of what you want us to do, and to do it. Reveal your power, your vision, your wisdom. Father, renew our minds, renew our hearts, light a fire, so that we can be a tool used by you to show this world the all-surpassing power that does not come from us, but that comes from you. And may the glory and honor reach heaven each and every moment of every day. We love you, Father. We pray this in your powerful name, Jesus. Amen.